Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this special edition of the Rodham Institute Speaker Series. Before I introduce our just wonderful guest who we're so honored to have join us today, just a quick, um, a quick review of what's happening in on the COVID uh, landscape. So, you know, lots has changed. Thank God that we have a vaccine, but we're also very thankful that we have a treatment. As you know, I'm a practicing internist and over this past five days, I've had 10 patients come down with COVID. Not everybody who gets COVID needs to be treated for COVID unless you're at high risk and only your clinician can tell you if you are. I will tell you that Paxlovid, the medicine is available, but you have to check with your pharmacy to see if it's, it's in stock. And you have to make sure that um, none of the medications you may be taking interfere because there are lots of drug interactions. You also have to start the medication within five days of the onset of your symptoms, not just the positive test. So on behalf of the Rodham Institute, I'm Dr. Gigi Elbayumi, the founding director and also a professor of medicine here at GW. The Rodham Institute is dedicated to improving health equity in Washington, DC. And as I say, for this very special edition in celebration of National Minority Health Month, we have Dean Dana Matthew from George Washington's Law School. And welcome, Dean Matthew. I am so glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. We're delighted. And I want to properly introduce you. And for the viewing audience, this is going to take a little bit of time, but it is so interesting. And of course, I have to read. There's no way I'm able to memorize this. So um, Dana Bowen Matthew, JD, PhD, is the Dean and Harold H. Green Professor of Law at the George Washington University Law School, a leader in public health and civil rights law who focuses on, on uh, dis, dis, I'm sorry, disparities in health uh, and health care, as well as the social determinants of health. Dean Matthew joined GW Law in 2020. It feels like just yesterday because of COVID, you came in right as COVID was starting. And that's she is the, I met you right away. And exactly, you, exactly. We found each other. She is the author of the best-selling book, Just Medicine, A Cure for Racial Inequality in America's Healthcare, and the newly released Just Health, Treating Structural Racism to Heal America. She did not ask me to, but I really want you to go to Amazon and buy these books because it's really important to read them, to discuss them, and to really begin the dialogue of what we can collectively do to improve health equity. Dean Matthew previously served on the faculty of the University of Virginia School of Law, where she was co-founder and inaugural director of the Equity Center, a transdisciplinary research center that seeks to build better relationships between UVA and the Charlottesville community through community engaged scholarship that, that uh, tangibly uh, redresses racial and socioeconomic inequality. This is what happens when you are over 50 and your glasses are new. And I'm so delighted that we were able to recruit Dean Matthew away from UVA because their losses are absolute win. Dean Matthew also has taken on many public policy roles. In 2013, she co-founded the Colorado Health Equity Project, a medical legal partnership incubator aimed at removing barriers to good health for low-income clients by providing legal representation, research, and policy advocacy. In 2015, she served as a senior advisor to the director of the Office of Civil Rights for the US Environmental Protection Agency, where she expedited cases on behalf of historically vulnerable communities besieged by pollution. She then became a member of the health policy team for US Senator Debbie Stallenhoe of Michigan and worked on public health issues. During 2015-16, she was a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Health Policy Fellow in Residence in Washington, DC and pivoted her work towards population level clients. 
She forged relationships with influential policy groups such as the Brookings Institute, where she is a currently a non-resident senior fellow and the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. She also is a member of the American Law Institute and currently serves on several public health boards, including the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, COVID-19 Vaccine Working Group, the American Society of Law, Medicine and Ethics, and the Scientific Advisory Council at the Foundation for Opioid Response Efforts. Before entering academia, um, Dean Matthew pr practiced as a civil litigator, both in Kentucky at the law firm of Greenbaum, Dahl and McDonald, and in Virginia at McGuire Woods, where her work primarily focused on the defense of medical care providers and corporate manufacturers in state courts, federal courts, and before administrative and licensing tribunals. Dean Matthew graduated with an AB in economics from Harvard Radcliffe, and after a brief stint as a commercial real estate banker, obtained a JD from the University of Virginia. While studying at Virginia, Dean Matthew served as the editor of the Virginia Law Review, won the law school's William Minor uh, Lyle Moot Court competition, and taught as a Hardy Dillard Writing Fellow. Following graduation, she uh, clerked for Justice John Charles, I'm sorry, again, I'm like looking at Thomas. John Charles Thomas, yeah. the first African-American justice to sit on the Virginia Supreme Court. She taught at Virginia as an assistant professor from 1991 to 1994. In 2018, she received a PhD in health and behavioral sciences at the University of Colorado at Denver. She has written numerous articles and book chapters on health and antitrust law topics that have appeared in the Virginia Law Review, the Georgetown Journal of Law, the American Journal of Law and Medicine, among others. Dean Matthew lives in Washington, DC with her partner, Dr. Thomas Matthew, and enjoys all things outdoors, including running, alpine skiing, travel, and spending time with family and friends. Wow, I feel tired just reading that. My God, <laughs> you know, and it's it's interesting because I know I've known you for a few years, but you know how it is you learn somebody's CV and all of their talents and credentials. So I just, um, you know, you like spending time with family and friends. Well, thank you for joining us as a friend of the Rodham Institute. And thank you for helping us celebrate and shine the light on national, the National Minority um, uh, Health Month because we've got a lot more work to do. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, um, Dean Matthew, to uh, begin. Dr. Alba, you know, it's such an honor to be with you. I have to say that the introduction was overly generous, but it is my view um, that uh, light attracts light and you were the first uh, light that I found on this campus already doing the work that is so dear to my heart. I found the Rodham Institute and I thought to myself, could it be that this is a partner? So many times when you come as an outsider in a new place to a university, the work that's already going is, um, is held as proprietary, is held as, um, uh, as owned or uh, in ownership. And your attitude has been so completely different. You've welcomed me, um, you've taught me, you've inspired me. Um, I want to say that one of the things that most inspires me about the Rodham Institute and your leadership is your deep connections with the community. I looked at your description online, and I'll just read this part. The Rodham Institute believes that those people who are closest to the problem know the best solutions where community leadership should be the locus of power to inform and drive change. Whether it is the Brooklyn Project, whether it is the series that you have done with blackdoctors.org, it is always the case, Dr. El Bayoumi, that you put the community first and center to, central to your equity work. That's not easy to do, but you're deliberate and intentional about it, and I admire it tremendously. I think it must come from the fact that you are such a good physician, so you know how to put the patient's interest first. It actually comes, it, thank you for such 
generous comments. It actually comes from my parents, both of whom are you know now retired professor professors, but are you know human rights activists. So this is kind of mother's milk to me. And thank you for the generous comments about the Rodham Institute. Yeah, you have to live and breathe health equity. You can't just talk the talk. You've got to walk mm -hmm. the walk. Mm -hmm. And you know, as you know, community partners know how to spot imposters. <laughs> they know authenticity and it's just about listening and showing up and they're in the driver's seat. And that's what I really loved about meeting you because I mean, you've already established an equity institute and I am just so grateful that you will be doing the same here at GW. And um, not only are you going to be doing it, you know, as a sort of in law, but it is going to be bringing all of us under one umbrella in the institution. And so it's the equity center so that whether it's law, whether it's public health, whether it's healthcare, we'll be all working together to synergize our work. So thank you so, so much. I appreciate that. I'm honored now to share uh, some ideas with you uh, that are in my most recent book project, which is called Just Health. And the ideas are for discussion. I'm going to um, uh, follow the directions of my um, <clears throat> run of show here. Um, and I'm gonna speak for about an hour. Um, uh, I probably won't be able to go for a full hour, but I'm gonna talk for the better part of an hour. Um, I wanted to say, because this is going to be a program shared with others, thank you not only to Dr. El Bayumi, who I've already um, said a few words about, but also the CEO of Black Doctors Org, which is Mr. Reg Reggie Ware, and the program manager of the Rodham Institute, who has been my contact and constant strength whenever I contact <laughs> uh, this wonderful organization, Ms. Ashanti Cor um, Carter. Um, this is in honor of April being National Minority Health Awareness Month. Um, and therefore, I'm gonna speak a little bit about what we can do together between law and medicine, between legal professionals, lawyers, paralegals, advocates, and medical professionals, clinicians of every stripe and ilk, even pharmacists and others who are in the healthcare world. Just Health is about the fact that justice is good for your health. So I'm gonna share my slide deck and just talk with you a little bit about what we might do together. Um, I might not use all my slides, but I'm gonna get started and maybe do a little bit of skipping around. Now, you tell me whether you're looking at my um, first cover slide, which I'm gonna play from the start. Um, and it just has the name of the book and the name of our university. Is that what you're looking at now? Yes, it looks beautiful. Okay, <laughs> very good. Well, let me start by saying I have one message at bottom and only one message only. And that is that health and justice go hand in hand. It is not possible to have a healthy society, a healthy community, a healthy people group, or even a healthy patient if any of those is suffering injustice, especially if that injustice is what I call structural injustice. And we'll talk about what that is. So I will therefore talk to you about structural inequality, the version of structural inequality that is structural racism. And then I'll talk about how law is integral to creating this inequality. But I will talk about it in terms of its health impacts, in terms of ways that we need to treat part four you see there's an error in my slide, I apologize for that. Part four, how we treat structural racism as a disease, as a health crisis, as the CDC has said, uh, Rachel Walensky called racism a public health crisis. And I'm going to adopt that. And then part five, not part four, is the cost of not treating structural racism. What is the cost of inaction? 
So in the beginning, I'll talk rather quickly because some of this we all know already. We know that health equity is something that we have defined as a goal, not only of the Rodham Institute, but of healthcare generally. We have gotten to the point in our discussion of health disparities to say that everyone should have a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. But my conversation with you today focuses on the fact that in order to do this, in order to achieve this health equity, we have to have removed unjust, unfair, and avoidable disparities. That is those disparities that come from discrimination. I'll talk to you first about general kinds of disparities, structural inequality. Structural inequality refers to the relationship, excuse me for a moment, going too fast, faster than my slides. Structural inequality refers to the relationship between differences in wealth and income and social outcomes. Again, structural inequality refers to the differences between wealth and income in a population and social and health outcomes. Why structural? Because it becomes predictable, because it infiltrates every one of society's institutions and because it is something that is enabled by law ultimately. I'll explain all three of those things. But first, let me give you an example of what is meant by structural inequality. What you see here is a measure of inequality called the Gini Index. This is used by the World Bank. And here you're seeing from 2000 to 2017, a composite Gini index that looks at the percentage difference between the top quintile of earners in a population and the bottom quintile of earners in a population. We're looking at the Gini index for the OECD nations, that is the developed nations, and those developed Western nations, the United States, Italy, Spain, you see on the left, all the way to the United Kingdom, the Czech Republic, Denmark on the right, the higher the difference, the greater the gap between the haves and the have-nots, the greater the Gini index. Now remember the United States of all of these OECD nations shown here has the greatest gap, the most inequality between the top quintile of earners and wealth holders and the bottom quintile as compared to other nations. Here's what is meant by structural inequality. What you see in the Gini index is now arrayed across the bottom x-axis of this graph. This is a, a, a graph from a study by Wil Wilkinson and Pritchard. And they have arrayed the Gini index, a measure of inequality along the x-axis and compared it to health and social outcomes on the y-axis. What we see here is a relationship that's structural because it is predictable and replicated across various countries. In the bottom left-hand corner, you see that Japan, which has the lowest income inequality of the countries arrayed here, again by a Gini index measure, is at the bottom also that is to show the best health and uh, social outcomes. So the health and social outcomes go from better to worse, bottom to top, because the researchers in this study took 10 indicators. They took indicators with respect to death due to heart disease, lung disease, due to stroke, and they took indicators about the differences in the levels of homicide, the levels of educational index, uh, attainment, and they combined them into one index. When they took those indices from better to worse, bottom to top on the left hand X, uh, Y axis and the index for wealth inequality on the bottom index, you see a predictable relationship. In the top right hand corner, the United States, the most inequitable of societies also has the worst outcomes for health and, uh, and, uh, and social outcomes. All right, so this is what we mean by structural inequality. We see it predictably, we see it in a positive relationship, we see it replicated over multiple societies, over multiple diseases, over multiple, multiple social outcomes. This is what is meant by structural inequality. Now the version of structural inequality 
that I talk about in Just Health and the version I'd like to focus on today in recognition of Minority Health Awareness Week is structural racism. All right, here we're going to need some definition. Before I define structural racism, let me tell you a story and it's about my parents. My parents are pictured here, May and Vincent Bowen. They're pictured here at ages 47 and 46. They were born one year apart. Two years after this photograph, my father would be dead. My father died at age 49. And the contention again is that my father died of injustice, or at least a major contributor in, in, in his early demise was injustice in the form of structural racism. Why? Well, let's start with his low wages. Between my father and my mother, they worked five jobs at the high school age when I was leaving to go to college. Why did they work five jobs? A couple of reasons, a couple of structural reasons. Number one, not a single one of those jobs paid a living wage. So although he would leave at nine o'clock in order to be at his office at nine o'clock in the morning, being the only person in my family and in my neighborhood, the South Bronx, to wear a suit to work, he would stride proudly up the street, get on the subway, go down to the Bowery Savings Bank, and he worked there as a real estate appraiser, a residential real estate appraiser, nine to five. But he did not earn a living wage. He came home at the end of that nine to five shift. He ate dinner and went to sleep and started the midnight 8 a.m. shift, driving the same subway line that he rode to his first job. So now we've got an eight-hour shift working as a member of the Transit Authority, Motorman Bowen, and an eight-hour shift as a member of the Bowery Savings Bank. Where, you say, do those other two jobs fit? They fit on the weekends. They fit in hours when he should have been recreating. They fit in hours when he should have been resting. They fit in hours when he could have been eating healthy. But it was the fact that none of his jobs paid a living wage that he found it necessary to work himself to the point of exhaustion and an early death. Why did he have to work that hard? Because we lived in the South Bronx, the second sex structural reason. We lived in the South Bronx and therefore the public schools to which I was assigned would never have allowed me had I gone to them for the entirety of my education career K through 12 to stand before you today with that wonderful privilege of being your Dean, of being a, uh, a recipient of the wonderful accolades that Dr. El Bayoumi introduced me with. I am not special in that I achieved all of this because I had exceptional talent. I achieved all of this because my father made sure I did not go to the school in the South Bronx that I was assigned to. All the children in my neighborhood, to a person who were able to escape the South Bronx and escape the life of poverty, of violence, of deprivation, left the South Bronx for school. And the reason I'm telling you my parents' story is not so that you'll feel sorry for me or them, it's because that is the identical story to every single one of my friends who got out. I named five in the book, none of their fathers are living. Some of their mothers are, but they have systemic disease and chronic comorbidities that I suggest are a function of the structural racism that consigned our neighborhood schools, consigned the residents of our neighborhood to these neighborhood schools that were failing. What would cause us to be limited to failing schools? Residential segregation. It's another structural way in which in these United States, people of color and people who are poor immigrant populations and minoritized people are relegated to not only housing, but neighborhoods that have inferior food, that have extra vulnerability with respect to pollution, that have extra exposure to over-policing, to neighborhood violence, to toxins and life in a food desert. This is another way of saying that place matters. I'll show you a few other images that will leave home with you the importance of injustices 
that affect a place that ultimately are shown in health outcomes. So here's a picture of flight 1549, which is a US Airways flight that you may have heard of if you saw the picture, Sully. The motion picture was about a plane that took off from LaGuardia Airport and it was headed for Charlotte, North Carolina, but it hit a gaggle of geese in flight and had to make an alert emergency landing in January, on January 9th, 2009, in the Hudson River. Now, I have to credit Dr. Thomas Leviste for this story, but let me show you why it's so important. January, the Hudson River is freezing, and the people on this plane, all 155 of them, exited the plane before it sank. You'll note, however, that they are divided distinctly into two different groups. In the back of the plane were the largest group. They're gathered to stand on the wing of the plane that is sinking, you'll see if you look closely, that the Hudson River chilly waters are lapping up around their ankles. The people in the front of the plane have it much better. They are not standing in the chilly water. They are in life rafts. They have life vests on. They have little canisters of food. They have flares to call for help. And what I mean to leave with you and the picture of my parents is that structurally where these people sat on the plane, structurally where my parents ended up living mattered to their life's chances. My father was dead at 49 because of the place he sat on the plane. If this group of 155 people had to be out for any length of time, the ones in the front would live longer, healthier lives than the ones in the back simply because of where they sat on the plane. The most recent example of this, of course, is the COVID-19 pandemic. When I wrote this originally, we had seen only 763,000 people die. We're nearly a million people now in the United States. And when I wrote this, we could divide those people by race and ethnicity. Native Americans suffering the highest degree of death and hospitalization, Black Americans, Asian Americans, Latino Americans, all not only suffering much more higher probability of poor outcomes, but also suffering less access to the vaccine and the medication that Dr. El Bayoumi was speaking of earlier. Now I'm gonna speed up. In the beginning of the pandemic, New York was a hot spot. Here's another example of why place matters because the people who were living in New York were living in densely populated, closely configured buildings. They rode elevators, they shared common spaces. Their residential inequality made them more susceptible to the pandemic. Not only their residential inequality, but where they worked. They worked in jobs that disproportionately deemed them essential. What that meant was instead of being able to stand as I did throughout the entire pandemic in my empty office, in my empty building before my uh, video screen in order to do my work, these people got on the subway. This is picturing a subway in New York City where 30% of all bus drivers are either black or Latino. Those who did the stocking of our food shelves, 20% are foods of food service workers, janitors, cashiers, people who were stocking Target to make sure that we had things that could be delivered to us at home were African-American and Latino in New York. 25% of all people who ride public transportation, remember the train that my father drove as his second job, are African-American and Latino-American in New York City. Where they lived, where they worked, but also where they learned. The schools, as you remember in my parents' story, are different in quality depending on where one lives in New York City. Inexperienced teachers, inequitable access to high college preparatory courses result in an achievement gap. And that achievement gap sets people up for less lucrative employment, unhealthy workplaces, less positive social networks, where you learn, where you eat, where you work, where you play, even in rural communities. This is the case that structural racism and structural inequality combine to produce poor health. Another way of saying it is that all the social determinants of health are inequitably distributed. 
That allows me now to conclude this section by giving you my definition of structural racism. My definition of structural racism is a system that does two things reliably, repeatably, and predictably. Number one, structural racism arrays people along a caste continuum based on how they look, making some of inferior and others of superior quality, making some of high value and others of low value simply by the way that they look. Structural racism, it can be said, in other words, is a way of institutionalizing white superiority or the ideology, that odious ideology, that one is more valuable to society simply because of the way that they look. That's the first thing that structural racism does. The second thing that structural racism does very efficiently, very predictably, is allocate all of society's resources according to that hierarchical caste that I described in step one. So all of the social determinants of health that affected the pandemic, all of the social determinants of health that affected my parents, all of the social determinants of health that are pictured in the object lesson of flight 1549 are arrayed and distributed by the value and worth of people in this structurally racist uh, uh, system. Now, some of you will wanna know what's the difference between structural and institutional racism, or what's the difference between structural and systemic racism. Structural racism in my world is the umbrella theory, and this is the, the, the theoretical paradigm that takes individual prejudice and moves it down to all of the institutions, institutional racism, that are the social determinants of health the educational, the housing, the employment, the criminal and civil justice, those institutions are the middle tier of this uh, conceptual diagram. It is the bottom tier that describes structural racism, the basis upon which all of the institutions, all the systems and processes filter up and throughout society to make sure that the two things I described structural racism as doing efficiently happen historically, no matter whether or not individuals are racist or not. Let me pause there and emphasize, at the top of this diagram, I describe interpersonal prejudice. Are you a bigot? Are you a racist? It is irrelevant whether you or I are individual racist or individual bigots. Why? Because at bottom, the system of structural racism operates by laws, by legislation, by decisions that institutionalize throughout all of the social determinants of health. So now I wanna turn, having made the definition clearer to you, to the role of law. If you remember the diagram, I will go back to it actually, law, is the operation through which structural racism does the three things at the bottom of this diagram. Number one, legalized dehumanization. Number two, legalized inequality. And number three, unequal protection of the laws. I'll take each one of those in turn in talking about the role of law. So when I think about dehumanization, I think about the late and great Bishop Desmond Tutu, because he understood that dehumanizing a population, making it seem as though someone is less than human because of their race, because of their ability, because of their sexual orientation, distinguishing you from me, I regard myself as fully human, possessed of all human characteristics, emotions, and needs, but you something different. When we do this, Bishop Desmond Tutu recognized that we not only dehumanize others, but we dehumanize ourselves. So structural racism historically dehumanized African-Americans. That's the example that I will use in the rest of my comments. But let me say quickly that other populations have been dehumanized by law in these United States. We have dehumanized immigrants. We have dehumanized people who have disability. We have dehumanized people because of their sexual orientation. We have dehumanized people because of their age. Here, I'm talking about the legacy of slavery. 
which would sell a human being by the pound as shown in this etching. The legacy of slavery during the colonial people uh, period that would take live people. This is a case if, uh, if you're in a property class that I teach. I teach this case because the humans who were deemed less than human, dehumanization, were thrown overboard when the ship Zong was in danger of sinking. They threw over their quote unquote cargo live into the sea and then went home safely to court to recover insurance for the loss of their property. Dehumanization is something that was baked into our legal system during the colonial period. But lest you think that dehumanization is no longer baked into our system, remember, if you will, the lack of clean drinking water, which was made possible by our legal system that dehumanized the people, largely black and poor in Flint, Michigan, that dehumanized them such that water, a basic human requirement, was not afforded to them because we needed then to save money to save the money for their city. And so here you see people having to march for a human need because our system told them that they weren't human. These are the evidences that dehumanization still operates legally today. Number two, legalized inequality. The laws of our country historically have been reliably a raid against minoritized populations. This legalized dehumanization is seen no more clearly than through the Jim Crow period, when it was not only riding on a bus or sitting at a lunch counter, but this grid shows a state by state list of the segregation statutes as of 1950, just before Brown versus Board of Education was decided. And if you had a chance to look closely, you would see it was not only railroad cars or buses that were segregated, but circuses, even cemeteries, water fountains, all of the human interaction was legally separated by law. But again, don't think that this is just a colonial period phenomenon or a phenomenon that occurred only during the civil rights movement. The third pillar, if you will, of dehuman, excuse me, of structural racism after legalized dehumanization and legalized inequality is unequal protection of the law. So we celebrated just recently the first African-American woman to ascend to the Supreme Court of the United States. I could stop here and speak for hours about the fact that this is a remarkable historic occasion of which we should be very, very proud and at the same time very, very ashamed because she indeed was not the first African-American woman to be qualified, but because of unequal protection of the law. That is, we have laws that are promising us that the equality that our founding fathers declared was the reason for our country. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all are created equal and our possessed of some unalienable rights by their creator, those rights, those laws have yet to be fulfilled and equally enforced. One example will suffice and you'll, I think, see what I mean. On the left of this graph, you see marijuana prevalence, use prevalence in, a, uh, in the past month by race, black and white, for the period 2014, excuse me, for the period 2001 to 2019, 2001 to 2019. Now, blacks are shown in the green bar and whites are shown in the yellow bar. So if we look at 2019, nearly 14% of blacks surveyed reported that they had used marijuana in the last month. And 12% of whites surveyed reported the same. So a little under 2% difference. However, if we look at the right graph, you see that marijuana possession arrest rates are very different for nearly the same period. By black and white race, black shown with the tall bars, white shown with the nearly level across the entire uh, display, yellow bars. And what you see here is a vast difference, unequal protection of the law, the conclusion, Law is the mechanism that maintains 
structural racism by creating the hierarchies that I described, institutionalizing them in all institutions of our society, housing, education, criminal justice, and distributes resources, opportunity and power by race. Since law is the mechanism of structural racism, law is the mechanism needed to dismantle structural racism. What are we looking for? We're looking for equality. Here now, I wanna talk about treating structural racism by referring to the period when there were segregated hospitals, expressly segregated waiting rooms, expressly segregated wards. I would have been born, if in Charlottesville, Virginia, in the basement or Negro ward, which located next to, in that hospital, the University of Virginia Hospital, the uh, veterinary ward. Both of us would have been in the basement at the same time. What desegregated the University of Virginia? Did we see these kinds of marches? Did we see these kinds of demonstrations? We did not. What we saw instead was a use of law, the mechanism that created structural uh, racism in order to dismantle structural racism. The takeaway message here, especially for the blackdoctors.org, is that that use of law was led by doctors. It was because George Simpkins and because Alfred Blunt and because six physicians, three dentists and two patients took on the challenge of suing the Moses H. Cohn Memorial Hospital and asked the court to enforce the laws that were written for equal protection of the laws, to reduce and eradicate legalized dehumanization of patients who were excluded based on race, and to reduce the legalized inequality that had relegated some to black wards and others to white wards, that we got the Civil Rights Act of 1964, that we got the 7,160 hospitals that were desegregated, it was because medical professionals, Dr. Alfred Blunt here brought that case. It was because medical professionals marched as part of the Medical Committee for Civil Rights, later called the Medical Committee for Human Rights. It was because of a structural solution formed in an alliance between those who are health professionals and those are medical professionals and realize that it is justice that is good for our health. Another way of looking at it is that healthcare became the hub of all of the social determinants of health, housing, education, job training, nutrition, recreation. All of these are necessary. And if we see them as human and civil rights that are essential for health, then perhaps I can convince those who are health professionals to take up the civil rights cause that so beautifully led to the civil rights acts that we enjoy today that are being dismantled today by the courts. As a lawyer, I am training as a law professor, as a law dean, I am training lawyers to work on opposing the dismantling of the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, the Fair Housing Act. But I am asking, even begging, pleading, with medical professionals to do as these have, to follow the example of Alfred Blunt, to follow the example of George Simpkins and to make civil rights your clarion call as well. What happens if we don't do this? We won't make any progress. The next two graphs really are to make one point. And that is that the civil rights laws have not changed enough to change the gap in health outcomes between black and right, white for over a hundred years. So yes, we've made progress. And you see here that the infant mortality rate has changed from 1915 to 2015 for blacks and whites, blacks shown in uh, the blue line, whites shown in the orange line, it's gone down. We have better care, prenatal care. We have wider insurance, better access. We have uh, uh, all kinds of antibiotics, things that make people healthier. 
But the story of this graph in the next is not in the lines that decline that show our successes, but in the top line, the gray line that has shown over a hundred years that the difference between black and white death rates, the difference has not changed. From in 1915, the rate of death difference, the gap between black and white deaths, 140 per 100,000. And where is it today? Pretty much in the same place. That's true for all cause mortality also, not just infant mortality. And so the ask for you is to begin to address the unequal protection of the laws in our social determinants of health as health issues. I could stop there and say no more, and I will have completed my message to you. I'll repeat it therefore. My call is for physicians, for nurses, for physician's assistants, for pharmacists, for those in the medical profession to see the injustice and inequality in the social determinants of health as a public health issue that you too must begin to be an active solution to. You must advocate for equal access to decent housing. You're no longer advocating against this kind of prejudice or this kind of red line process. Instead, you're advocating now for the sequence of events that were set up by those inequalities. Residential segregation persists and because it does, it constrains what your access to food is, social capital is, to clean air to breathe, to clean water to drink and health outcomes are directly the result of that. This is a diagram of the many pathways that indecent housing, segregation, substandard quality housing produces poor health. Those outcomes are largely concentrated in minoritized underrepresented communities. That's structural racism. How do we know? New York City. Let's just look at the building code violations in New York City. On the right, you see the red dots for where most building code violations are located, concentrated. On the left, you see a dot map by color that tells you what the race is of the people that live in New York City. Now, again, I told you my story. I live in the South Bronx. If you know New York, you know the green long strip on the left side of the left-hand map is Manhattan, a largely white population shown by the concentration of green dots. You know the bottom area, that is largely blue, I didn't mean to pass that, uh, that is largely blue, is Brooklyn, it's largely black, and uh, immigrant populations from the African diaspora. And you know also that the area that is largely Latino, that is orange and, uh, and uh, red Asian, uh, is the Bronx, right? So Latinos concentrated in the areas that are in the far right top corner, Blacks concentrated in the middle and lower left. Where are the dots? Where are the building code violations? They're in the Black and Latino neighborhoods of the South Bronx and Brooklyn. They are very few and far between in the Manhattan largely white concentrated areas. I'm gonna flip through another set of heat maps very quickly. What you're looking for is a correlation between, and these are all New York City, the dark spots on the map will show you the concentration of the adverse conditions in social determinants of health. So remember this racial array. Dark spots, higher asthma prevalence. Light spots, yellow in Manhattan, largely white dark spots, Brooklyn and Bronx, largely Black and Latino. Dark spots, food insecurity on the left. Light spots, Manhattan, largely white. Darkest spots, South Bronx, some darkness in the Brooklyn area, largely Black. On the right, unsurprisingly, dark spots for obesity, not in Manhattan, but in Brooklyn and in the South Bronx. You can do this all day. We can do it here for income. High income is shown here in the dark spots. It's a reverse. Higher income is the dark green, lower income is the light green. 
So here, dark green, higher income in Manhattan, the largely white populations, lower income. Brooklyn is not shown on this one. It's the Bronx that's shown here. Light income, less income in those areas that are largely Black and Latino in the Bronx. You can advocate for decent access to education. You're no longer advocating against this kind of segregation, but instead, you're and, and you're no longer looking for a, 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 a law like Brown versus Board of Education or Plyler v. Doe, which is the uh, uh, equivalent for Mexican immigrant children uh, 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 of the case law that the Supreme Court decided in order to desegregate schools. But now you're looking for a much more complex relationship between educational attainment and health outcomes. This is by uh, uh, a uh, from an article uh, by Hogue, H-O-U-G-E. -G, uh, um, I believe her first name is Carolyn, but don't quote me on that. Educational attainment produces good health. And these are some of the pathways by which it does or does not produce good health outcomes. What you know, your literacy, your social standing, your ability to work in places that don't require four and five jobs as my parents required, your ability to have exposure to hazards, much more dangerous to work if the night shift in Woodlawn, uh, driving the subway train from the Woodlawn train station uh, uh, at eight o'clock, uh, excuse me, midnight to eight o'clock, than it was nine to five to go sit in an office at the Bowery Savings Bank. Remember, the examples I'm giving you from my father's life are not unique. He is an exemplar of many, many populations who look like him. But it is this structural disparities, funding K through 12, compared between white districts, predominantly white districts and predominantly black and Latino districts, uh, results in a gap in 2019 of $23 billion with a B. Better funded if you live in a white neighborhood than if you live in a black neighborhood. And again, recall my father's story, right? Where he said, I have to work these jobs because the schools in my neighborhood are poorly funded. I have to take a picture of my uh, uh, parents. My parents took a picture in Maine and the reason was they had to get me out of the Bronx, not because this was the criminal justice that I was exposed to, but because this was the criminal scenario that I would have been exposed to if I stayed home in the summer. The crime rate, again, let's look at the dark portions, very dark in the South Bronx, dark blue, where the concentration of high crime rates on the left, very light, on the right, where the concentrations of the best schools are shown by dark purple, best schools, dark purple, worst schools, light purple. And what we mean by structural racism is when these multiple social conditions pile on top of one another. Another way of saying it is that these are comorbidities that are social, right? We looked at the, uh, the death and hospitalization rate due to COVID-19. And many people said it was because of comorbidities. I'm suggesting that what you as medical professionals describe as comorbidities are not only biological, but also social. When you say comorbidities, you think of many medical conditions that combine person has heart disease and diabetes and they're obese. So there are many medical conditions that combine. I'm suggesting to you that structural racism is effective in making many social conditions combine, that the same people who live in the area that is prone to pollution or housing defects are also the people who live in neighborhoods where jobs are not plentiful and working conditions are poor and their children are more likely to be suspended. This is disparities in suspensions, right? Structurally, you may all be in the same school but the suspension rate for preschoolers who are black is two and a half times the suspension rate for preschoolers who are white. One and a half times for preschoolers who are Native American. That which is uh, suspensions for uh, those who are white students. Same with preschoolers. Preschoolers, remember, this is before age five, um, are expelled more frequently twice as often if they're black and two and a half times greater um, if they are disabled, um, then white or abled students. 
These structures create what we call the prison to school to prison, school to prison pipeline. Here in high school, we see in one school in Connecticut. For the same behavior, white students get referred more likely to treatment. Black students, Latino students get referred more likely to juvenile training school. All of the differences that are produced by an achievement gap are predictable when you look at access to the math and science courses that are disparately unavailable to students in schools who are black, the red dot, uh, the red bar, versus students in school who are white and frequently get the top blue bar. Another way to look at these is students with access to the full range of math and science courses that prepare them for college. 81% of students who are white, 68% of students who are native of white and Hawaiian and Pacific Islander have access to the full range of college preparatory courses. And we know that educational attainment will produce longevity. So the last thing I wanna say about what the cost of, of, uh, of, of structural racism is, uh, it generalizes it because I've been talking about the cost to minoritized populations, but there is a body of research that I'm representing with one of many studies here that shows that racial bias is associated with in-group death for blacks and whites higher infant mortality rates, higher death due to myocardial infarction in neighborhoods that by either survey for explicit prejudice or one of my favorites, scraping Twitter and Google data to show where there's a concentration of searches for racial epithets, the N word and such. The higher the concentration in that geographic location, the higher the death rates for black and white population. We need to treat, treat structural racism because it kills all of us. We need to treat it in housing and healthcare providers are already doing that. After Medicaid data showed that homelessness was one of the chief causes for repeat offenders, United Healthcare, Unity Healthcare, and Boston University are examples of health care providers, institutions that have partnered with housing advocates and housing providers to address the inequality in this important social determinant of health. It can be done in nutrition and food to address insecurity. The Brockton Neighborhood Health Center is a federally qualified health center that used social impact bonds to co-locate a Cape Verdean supermarket next door to the clinic and between them is a test kitchen where patients get taught how to not only take care of their diabetes medically, but also how to eat the right food and then can take the food prescription next door to the supermarket. These are ways that the Children's Hospital of San Antonio is using to increase access to food, not just on an emergency basis. A food bank is great, but it's only great for the day, for the week that that food lasts. But to teach people how to eat well, to make sure that there are avenues for them to get good food. That's gonna require sustained intervention that I'm suggesting is only going to be possible if medical and legal professionals work together. Here's another example, last example, violence prevention. Even though we talked about how over-policed my neighborhood was mm -hmm. and how emphatically my parents worked to get me out of the neighborhood, remember that was a part of what drove them. If we change the structures of violence, Children's Hospital in Wisconsin is one example. If we change the structure of violence from a health perspective and treat these racialized biases that land kids in emergency rooms due to violence repeatedly, Project Ujima is a multidisciplinary violence project that when a kid under 18 lands in a emergency room, instead of sending them back out into the street, they send them out with a caseworker, with a series of activities, with a series of treatments and interventions, and their success rate is really quite impressive. There are many people who are doing this work in the healthcare industry. And what I'm suggesting to you is that there are so many places to start. You could intervene by advocating for living wages, for equal funding for education, 
for diversifying the medical workforce itself, for enabling the distribution of pollution burdens to be equal instead of inequitable, for enforcing some of the statutes I've shown the federal ones, but there are state and local ones also. All of this is because health is a byproduct of justice. And my message is that the only way we get there is together. This is a stand of redwood trees. They look like individual organisms, but their root system underground is connected. They're only as strong as their connection with one another. And I appreciate that you let a lawyer talk to you about connecting with healthcare providers in order to achieve just health. Wow, Dean Matthew, that was amazing. And um, you so elegantly uh, illustrated and brought together uh, what our motto is uh, at the Rodham Institute, it's actually on our landing page, that health justice equals legal justice, equals you know all forms of justice. They're all intertwined and they are all interdependent. So first of all, thank you for sharing your story about your father. I'm sure your parents, your late father, are extremely proud of you. And I'm sure he's looking down at you because you have made him and your family very, very proud. Um, I know when I'm told that, especially of, of, as being of Egyptian origin, I'll say, but I'm one of millions because your parents prioritize your education as many other parents and families do but can't really always accomplish that. And it brings to mind Emmett Till's story. Yes. Emmett Till's mother was trying to protect him from the violence that was going on in Chicago. She sent him to her relatives in Mississippi. He could not escape the violence and the structural racism. And uh, so, you know, sadly, your melanin content your zip code, your class does determine your life expectancy. And I just want to build on a couple of things that you mentioned and bring it to sort of Washington, D.C., which is where we're at. And just to acknowledge blackdoctor.org as a co-sponsoring, um, a co-sponsor of this wonderful webinar, which for those of you that are watching, please know that it will be rebroadcast on BDO and will be on our website. I'd like to also thank, in addition to Mr. Reggie Ware, uh, Mr. Ellis Dean, who is the producer and, um, and, and uh, actually we're working for our next state of African-American health on, on BDO. So, you know, 80%, I mean, doctors, you know, we probably have the biggest egos on the planet. And we think that we're the ones that are saving lives. And, you know, we do, uh, uh, but, 80% of your life expectancy is not determined by us. It is by the economic health of your neighborhood, your education, the food, the, 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 the soil, because you used you know, the, the redwood trees, the quality of the soil that you are born into, grow up in, live and work and play in. Um, you know, it's, it's something that I want to just quote a couple of statistics that relate to Washington, D.C., and I would really recommend that people go to the Uneven um, Opportunities Study, which is online. It was commissioned by the Kaiser Family Foundation in uh, addition to working with Virginia Commonwealth University. And it basically shows you many of the same graphs that uh, Dean Matthew showed you, which are essentially the same, you know, where there's concentrations of black people and brown people, that's where you'll find the biggest uh, uh, worst outcomes. But I wanna tell you about DC because we've got actually the worst outcomes per capita in the country. If you live in the rich part of DC, Georgetown, you can expect to live 94 years on average. If you live in Anacostia, the poorest part, 66 and a half years. Tell me what country in the world or what city in the country there is a 26 and a half year disparity in a 10 mile span. We are number one in HIV mortality, cancer mortality and end stage kidney disease. 
And the reality is if you are in Ward 8, the infant mortality is the same as El Salvador and Cambodia, and the HIV rate is the same as Namibia. And, you know, to, to Dane, Dean Matthews' very powerful illustration of education and its role, only 42% of, uh, of kids in high school graduate from high school in Ward 8. If all I did as a physician or for any of the physicians, clinicians that are um, listening to this, if all we did was graduate or help kids graduate from high school, we would add 10 years of life to their life expectancy. So I want to you know, add something that's special about Washington, DC. We're a territory, we are not a state and we, our budget is overseen by Congress. So why is that important? Well, during COVID, I'm a, uh, an unfriendly uh, Congress and president to the district, we got two thirds of the COVID uh, monies from the stimulus, COVID stimulus package, two thirds. Now uh, the Biden-Harris administration released it. There's now talk of, um, of, of getting uh, statehood for DC, but I submit to you that that talk is, is gaining traction because when I first came here to Washington DC, it was Chocolate City back in, my, in 1985, 84% African-American, maybe 87%, now 46%. So where are people going? They're being pushed out. Um, before I ask my questions, I want to, you know, cause you spoke about your father, um, uh, my father who's still living, uh, came from Egypt um, on a fellowship to do uh, his, his um, PhD at Florida State University in Tallahassee. The first thing that he did was get off the train and he thought that Tallahassee is the capital. He knows about Miami and the movies. Now mind you, this is in 1956. And so he, he, he looks and it's just this like little platform and, and the water fountain says color or yeah, colored and white. It's like these Americans think of everything. <laughs> so he goes to the faucet and it's clear and it's warm. So he said, you know what? You know, the Egyptian mentality, it must be broken. Okay. So, um, so then, <laughs> and mind you, this was before internet, cell phones, you know, everything was through movies, you know, that were showing the glory of the United States. So then he, um, by this time, you know, my, my mother also got her degree from Florida State. My parents are married. And um, actually one of the people that really f informed them on their civil rights education in the United States uh, was Shanita, my, uh, my nanny. And Shanita was the one that introduced them to um, uh, black Muslims and the movement and how it, it varied. <laughs> but so they're here, they've been here for a couple of years and the newspaper guy comes and he says, uh, would you like the colored edition? My father says, is it the same cost? Is it the same price? And he said, yeah. He said, the whole time you could have had the colored edition. And of course he gets it. He's like, this is not colored. It's just, I mean, if you land as an alien, which is essentially what they were doing, it just does not make sense. So, um, and, and you, you reference South Africa. My, my parents were part of the uh, Peace Center at Michigan State that helped Michigan State be the first university to divest from South Africa. Um, you know, the, you, I mean, you, you have talked so much about, you know, the, the depth and breadth. You also discuss some very concrete steps that we can take. I'd like to talk about, I'm gonna get a little uncomfortable to talk about concrete steps within our own institutions because one of the reasons that I established the Rodham Institute, especially as Americans, we think about Africa as where all the problems are, right? We never look at our own houses, our own practices. So my plea for everybody that's listening is advocate for the people that may not have the degrees that you work with, especially those of us that work in healthcare settings, advocate for them to have a living wage, which they don't have, 
one in three uh, direct service workers, including people that we worked alongside of taking care of COVID patients quit during COVID. And they're predominantly African-American women here in DC. They did not have the same protections. They had to take care of multi-generational households, manage you know, kids and their online learning. That is if they even had internet, they got sick more often. So think about whether they get the same tuition benefits that we do as MDs or JDs. Think about whether they, uh, they have the same perks. Uh, these are things that are difficult, but as you said, Dane, Dean Matthew, it is not about an individual or a person being racist. It is not doing something about the inequity. So um, I just wanted to say a couple of other things because I mean, there was so much that you were, that you, I mean, my head is, is kind of spinning because there's so much that you talked to us about. Um, I guess my next question is, uh, because you did talk about action, what is your vision for the GW Law School? I mean, you know, you, you are a huge get for the GW community, but what ah. are you as the dean? No, 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 truly, I'm not. You know, I, well, maybe you don't know, but I can tell you I'm not somebody who is effusive about people that don't deserve it. But what do you see as the vision um, at, the, at the law school and, and maybe even beyond? Well, one of the privileges, thank you for the question, one of the privileges of working in an institution of higher education mm -hmm. is that it aligns perfectly with my personal vision of what I want my life to be about. I want us to contribute to making a better society. And that's what higher education does. At bottom, we contribute to helping to solve some of society's most pressing problems. So our twofold mission at the law school, number one is to disseminate excellent knowledge. And number two is by our pedagogy to educate excellent students. We can do both of those things in ways that help to improve our society, indeed our democracy, because we're located right here in Washington, DC. We're the oldest law school in the nation's capital. So when we train students to look at the law as something that is an instrument of equality, a foundation of democracy that is required to make us a more perfect union, we train students whether they're interested in international trade law or they're interested in property law, corporate law, civil rights law, we train law students to recognize that they are the agents, the mechanism, as I said in this presentation, the mechanism of whether we continue or dismantle structural racism. So my vision is to help train students that think that they have a role in making equal justice under the law come to pass. And to educate them based on research that we're doing, whether it's looking at laws, that grid that I showed you of the segregation laws in the United States, one of the research projects that I left behind at the University of Virginia, I wasn't able to finish it while I was there, was correlating those laws, how long they took to be adopted, how long they took to be repealed, with the health outcomes in different states in order to make the argument that what a state does with its equality laws has an effect on health also. So creating and disseminating the kind of knowledge that people can use. So if I may put in a plug for the Equity Institute initiative, we are looking at creating a infrastructure, an institute that gathers together all the people around the university, view in medicine, Right, Dr. James Foster at the Elliott School, Dr. Sonia LeBlanc at the School of Engineering, and people all over this institution who care about racial and ethnic equality, care about socioeconomic equality, and help each other design research projects and teach our students to cooperate and collaborate across disciplines to solve the problem of racial inequality. That's my dream for the law school and for GW. Mm -hmm. Located here in Foggy Bottom, we have the largest footprint in the middle of the nation's capital. And it would be a fabulous contribution to society's intractable problem of structural racism for there to be an institute here 
that again serves our twofold mission of educating students and disseminating knowledge. Wow, I want to talk to you about our experience in medicine because it's a little bit different. I mean, everybody who goes into any profession uh, or many professions, it's a calling. I know I've got two uh, family members who are attorneys and they wanted to do it for all the right reasons and go in and do you know, public defender work. And unfortunately, things like loans uh, made them unable to do that, the high debt burden. But um, I am a medical educator. I oversaw our medical students for five years and then our residents for 15 years. And our students come in with wonderful attitudes, yeah. especially now they've done a lot of community work. But guess what? I came to the conclusion that even though I tried to mitigate what happens to them during their training, I actually was not successful. And I dare say that we actually teach racism. And let me tell you how. Despite all the wonderful work being done on DEI and implicit bias, this is what happens. Let's say that there are two women, both with pneumonia. One is a college professor here at GW. Another is a homeless woman who's HIV positive, who's schizophrenic, and in the midst of a psychotic break. I always ask, who's easier to talk you know, to take care of, of course, the college professor, you tell her to take her medicines, you know, with food or it's food, it's got to be refrigerated. Oh, oh, by the way, try to navigate our phone system and call us. If there's a problem, if she can't get through, she'll call one of her colleagues and say, I can't get through to Ilbayumi. What, what can I do? She'll have a warm place to, to go to afterwards. The homeless woman can be challenging to take care of just on a personal level. Nobody wants to get yelled at. But also what happens is that because of the fact that there is actually no, um, there's no shelter in Washington DC, no homeless shelter that takes care of women with medical issues. There's one called the Christ House for men. So do you know what we do? Oh, you got to discharge, you got to discharge. This is, you know, administration, you got to discharge. Well, what do we do when the, it's, it's below freezing? We're asking our learners to send somebody out in the streets. So what happens, because we don't have the holistic way of taking care of patients in the, in the hospital, and because of poverty and all these other ails, when that student becomes a resident, becomes a fellow, and is deciding on where to practice or sees this poor African-American woman with this demographic, they're like, oh, no, 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 I don't wanna take care of that patient. So, you know, to me, what is crucial is that all of us see people when they're not sick. Learn the story about this homeless woman. She must have family. What was her story? Many people don't realize that there are homeless people that actually were airline pilots and got fired or air traffic controllers. So, you know, in, in closing, um, I just want to say thank you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. We're so yeah. delighted that you could join us and enlighten us and really get us to think about what we as individuals can do, how the, 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 the really the framework to think about things and I'm going to give you the last word, Dean Matthew. I feel privileged to have not only uh, been with you during this time, but also to partner with you in the Rodham Institute's work. Uh, I have been wonderfully, wonderfully surprised by how many across this great university are already deeply entrenched in community work, deeply entrenched in research and creating knowledge that will address this intractable issue. I think what I'll say in closing is that now is the time. Now is the time for action if there ever was a time. The pandemic gave us an object lesson of the inequality and how it can devastate people disproportionately. The George Floyd murder and all of the injustice around it gave us an opportunity to pause and see the state of dehumanization of inequality and what happens the January 6th insurrection showed us how powerfully problematic it is for the rule of law 
to be abandoned. It's all of our responsibility right now. It's all of our opportunity right now to address this health, but indeed justice problem in order to produce good health for all. Thank you, Dean Ma De Dana Matthew, JD, PhD, De Dean of the Law School. Thank you to blackdoctor.org for being our co-sponsor. And last but not least, thank you to Ms. Ashanti Carter, Program Manager of the Rodham Institute, where we work to improve health equity right here in Washington, DC. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.